I don't know what it was. He's walking upright like a man. Sightings in and around Vermont. Bigfoot sightings across New England have been reported. Red glowing eyes, about seven feet tall. Red eyes, big old fangs, claws coming out through. Three inches long, you know, just sharp as they could be. There has been another UFO sighting flying over the Royal Botanic Gardens. There are 500 UFO sightings in the world every month. The truth is out there. We're back. We are back. We're back. Uh, so anyone who's not in the Discord, because Discord knows, we missed the other week mm-hmm. because my daughter had a tummy bug. And then a week went by and I went, whew, I'm safe from this tummy bug. And then I double barreled everything for three days straight in court, including our normal. <laughs> I, 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 this was probably a half hour or so before we usually record. Yeah, I, it was, I, it was, I, was, I was, I was trying to, I was like, I was, I was like, I'm, I'll write me, it out. I'll be fine. I'll make it. Let me, I'll make it. And I texted you from the bathroom the, floor. Let me grab the, the text message. Uh, do, 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 do. <laughs> let's see. So it was. Um, it's fucking terrible, Navis. Round of hell let loose. Oh, Sunday. Here we go. Oh, Apologies, wait. I can't record. Dot dot dot. I caught my daughter's stomach bug. It's a bad one. <laughs> it is a bad one. <laughs> let's um, let's do a quick pause. Um, so something else that happened. I was on my laptop before because my computer died. I'm on my new computer. And I just got it set up for recording, and I just realized that I'm recording at 48 kilohertz. So I'm just going to go ahead, stop, and keep this track, and then switch my my recording frequency. <laughs> so we don't have to start over. We'll keep this. We don't have to start over. Okay. We don't have to start. No, we're keeping all this is staying. It, okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'll go ahead and stop. Okay. And that's what you call doing it live. Yeah, that sure is. Ooh, um, my mic. Oh, God. Yeah. So that wasn't a fun time. It sounds like a fun time to me. I don't know what you're talking <laughs> it was, about. It was Sometimes, so hey, you know what the fun part is? It's when you when you just like aim and see what you can hit. It's oh god. Okay, so here's this will tie into the other part of uh, another story. Okay, so I'm on the bathroom floor. Uh huh. Where it's it's we're playing the game of like. It's is Snoop Dogg watching sh- sh- over sh- you? Yeah, like hold hold your tummy so you can shit, and as soon as the poop stops, flip around so you can throw. So I'm in the bathroom. That's going on around the same time I'm texting you. Mm-hmm. And I mm-hmm. didn't realize Erica was on a call with her dad. So oh, no. In the bedroom, which shares the wall with the bathroom. So I just start yelling, bucket, bucket, get the bucket. Bu-. So I'm just because I just need because I can't. It's some both are going to happen at the same time at some point. <laughs> so I need the bucket. <clears throat> that's what the tub's so, for. That's that's what the tub's for. So what I didn't know is her dad heard me. <laughs> he was like, "Oh, he said, I hope he's doing well." He said he oh. said something about it. it didn't sound like I was doing good. But the reason she was on the phone with her dad, and this is something I told you about, is her car. Um, oh yeah, started yeah, making, yeah, yeah. Like a thunk noise. On occasion, so and her dad works on cars. I was gonna. My plan mm-hmm. was to take it to a shop, but I couldn't because I, um, my bathroom was busy. And um, yeah, yeah. So her, yeah. her dad comes, picks up the car, takes it back to his garage, and uh, pops the rear tires off. And, and the the fucking the rear brake drum assembly just falls apart. Oh, it, it was brand new. <laughs> it, we got it last year from Mavis Tire. <laughs> It was brand new. So what they did is they they got the new drum assembly and put the old hardware and bits in it. He said, like, the spring, the shoe. He said it just came off. Oh. (laughs) So the brakes weren't on the car. So the thunking was anytime the brake tried to engage because it wasn't together or mounted. Oh, no. It would just rotate until it hit something and stopped. (laughs) Oh, that's good. That's good to know. (laughs) Yeah, so maybe don't uh, go to Mavis for anything important. <laughs> I just get my tires replaced there. <laughs> oh, no. The reason it went there is because her dad's in his 60s, and I know that like, yeah, he can do yeah, most yeah. things, but like certain things are a bit harder to do, and I'm like, I'll, you know, I'll save Gus the time. and mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. Uh, have, So I was trying to be nice, but it turns out 
they almost done killed my family. Oh, because she called she called me to get my car. This is a, two days prior because I was also homesick. And she was like, I got to take the truck, your uh, your truck, because I'm not driving with her kid in this car because it sounds so bad. That's fair. That's <laughs> yeah. legitimately fair. If you hear a, th- anytime you hear a thunk in a car, we call yeah. that the John Dunham special because I usually, usually will John drive. Special. Well, I will continue I'm- to drive. This is the, well. This is a week ago at this point. Um, uh, there was a limo that got its brakes ch- uh, changed at Mavis. Uh, it was four days ago, as mm-hmm. of last week, so a week and four days ago now. And uh, they failed and killed all sixteen people in the fucking limo. What in 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 New York? Like not far from oh, here. Oh my god! <laughs> yeah. Was, what, well, well. Here's the question: What kind of limo was it? Was it a Hummer limo? Uh, I don't, I don't think I so. I feel like it's not a good idea to make a joke about a, a car accident that had 16 people dying. You know what? <laughs> On second thought, yep. let's not make that joke. Let's not. <laughs> oh. It took me a minute to get there, but I got it. I got it. <laughs> oh boy. Oh. Uh, I, I guess, I guess this is a podcast about... <laughs> This is a podcast not about making jokes about uh, a bunch of deaths. Um, instead, it's a podcast about cryptids, paranormal, uh, aliens, particularly aliens this week. Uh, but the name of the podcast is Cryptopedia, and I'm John. Yes, I'm Brandon. And Brandon, this week, uh, our our episode is kind of an interesting one. Um, okay. It's interesting in that people lose their fucking shit over it right um like when i say people lose their shit over this like people lose their fucking shit over this not in the same way i was losing my shit last yeah no 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 okay not not in that way at all not in that way at all um people really really like like ufo like pro ufology people they like cherish this story it is like their their go-to um, yeah. it, it's, it's practically, you know, the pill shaped UAV, right? Yeah. It's, it's kind of on the same level as that for them being like, Hey, look at this evidence. Right. Cause, yeah. cause everyone's like, Oh, U S government is responsible for that. U S government, the, the U S military is the most credible thing ever. They would never lie about anything ever. <laughs> um, but, but like in no uncertain terms, this is usually called the most credible UFO sighting. Yeah, uh, yeah, ever right. Um, and we're gonna take a trip to 1994 uh, to All hear right. about it, which uh, coincidentally is the same year. That, now that I'm thinking about this, is pretty good. It's the same year that Rise of the Beast takes place. So oh, this God. might <laughs> this might just be Transformers. Now that I think about it, um, it is just Transformers. So we're going back to 1994 to hear about an experience of 62. And I'm going to put that in quotes because there's a little bit more. Uh, there's a little bit. So that's the the thing that people usually quote as being the number. But I take some offense to that number. But we'll talk about that later. Uh, okay. 62 elementary school students in Ruwa, Zimbabwe. Today, Brandon, we're going to be talking about the aerial school phenomena. And for those of you listening, that's not spelt aerial as in like in the sky. It's a R I E L, as in the Little Mermaid. R E L, yeah. R E L, and you know the most credible witnesses are elementary school children, ages six to thirteen. There's, I definitely never really, honestly, in earnest, tried to capture a leprechaun at that age. I definitely didn't ever try to do that. I mean. Yeah, no, that never happened. Never in a million years. That's not like one of the most popular things to do around St. Patrick's Day in this area. But whatever. The Um, young mind is infallible. Infallible. So, Brandon, on the 14th of September, 1994, a Wednesday, mm -hmm, uh, an object was seen streaking across the night sky in southern Africa around 9 p.m. Uh, witnesses were baffled about the origin of the sighting, prompting a wave of reports across South- Southern Africa of sightings of unidentified aerial phenomena, or UAPs, um, with discussions of UAP and UFOs dominating the airwaves. Although back then, I don't think the term UAP was typically used, right? Uh, no, because I think that's, that's a, th- a more that, recent of that's a, thing. 
that's a more recent thing for ufologists yeah. to to divorce uh ufos from you know little green men um so the bbc uh and the zbc which is the zimbabwe broadcasting uh company gave viewers a call to action to report anything that they had seen to the networks Initial reporting seemed to be point to a meteor shower being the culprit of this flap, uh, but Brian Dunning uh, of Skepoid and Hell Charlie yeah. Weiser, $3 kit, uh, point to the re-entry of a Zenit 2 rocket from the Cosmo 2290 satellite launch as being the culprit. Um, this is this is one of those things that also a lot of... Uh, uh, a lot of people who are proponents of the aerial school phenomena stuff will mention this, and they'll talk about, like... There's no uh, meteor showers on the books, and the, it's unlikely that the Zenit 2 is responsible for this. Although, honestly, like, it's probably the Zenit 2, most likely. Yeah. Um, and also, aerial phenomena, like, is not... See, this is the problem with this, this thing being called the aerial school yeah. is I can't use the most useful word to describe <laughs> aerial <laughs> phenomena. Um, regardless, so... Two days later, Brandon. Okay. On September 16th, 1994, students at the Aerial School, an elementary school in the farming community in northeastern Zimbabwe, reported having an alien encounter. For reference, I'm going to be using the original reporting on the event made by the first MUFON investigator, Cynthia Hind, in the 1994 December issue of MUFON, of the MUFON, uh, which is the Mutual UFO Network, UFO Journal. So, for those of you keeping track, that is the Mutual UFO Network UFO Journal. Yes. <laughs> Why it's not just the MUFON Journal, I don't know. But, you know, whatever. Um, so, and I, I'm, I'm going to be using the this initial report because, from okay. my perspective, the most important thing when we're talking about these types of stories... So... Um, Obviously, there's a bunch of reporting. There's a bunch of people talking to these kids. There's a bunch of people talking to these kids, even today, right? Um, yeah. From my perspective and my point of view, uh, the only reporting that's worth a damn on this particular story is the initial report, right? Yeah. yeah um, well, the, the, the earlier reports or the, <clears throat> the earlier reports that you read means that those people won't have been influenced by having read prior reports. Yes, and there's less time for memory to do what memory does. Yeah. Um, but there's more. We're going to get into this a lot because there's a lot of problems, even with this report. So um, so it was about 10, 15 a.m. that Friday when the faculty of the school were in a meeting and children were outside playing that something happened that rocked the private elementary school. And once again, I want to remind you, this is a private elementary school. We'll get into that, yeah. what that means later, but this is a very private elementary school, okay? Very private. Um, and, okay. So, allegedly, three silver balls appeared in the sky over the school, disappearing in a flash of light and reappearing elsewhere three times. So, we got some, like, weird teleportation mumbo-jumbo yeah. happening. So, after wrapping, uh, warping around, the balls began to descend towards the school supposedly following nearby by power lines, although that is a bit of misreporting uh, because apparently there was another sighting on Thursday and that was related to that sighting, the, the power okay. line thing. Gotcha. Um, with one either touching down or hovering near the children. There's no consensus on uh, whether it landed or hovered, right? And okay. I want to take a moment to, to, to highlight that um, the lack of consensus in this story between the, the viewers and like the, the witnesses is frequently cited as being evidence that this is a real event. Wait, how? We'll get into that. How? We'll get into that. How? We'll get into that. Um, but I just want you to keep in like pay attention to these differences because the differences and similarities are used to be like, see, this is this is this is real. This is real because like. Blah 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 blah, and we'll get into it. I have it written. I have I have writing okay, and like okay. thought out everything. I just wanted to take a moment to point it out because it's worth it for you to remember all these differences. Um, gotcha. All the differences, but the th all the differences really are make a, a stronger point that this is a true thing. Yes, yes. It okay. just makes our it makes our our proof more valid, not less valid. Gotcha. Um, okay. Yeah. So, the landing site 
was a section of rough ground made up of trees, thorn bushes, and some brown cut gray grass with bamboo shoots sticking up out of the ground. Due to the presence of snakes, spiders, and other potentially dangerous animals, the children were not permitted in the area. Moreover, the area was rough with only one track for tractors to be used in maintenance facilities, uh, like okay. p- capacities, um, yeah. and it had no fence. Importantly, this was not an empty field, but a location with dense vegetation and underbrush, something that will come into play in uh, later in the history of the story. Now, I have a picture of the aerial school. Uh, I love here. a map. Yeah, so this is a map uh, from Afternoons 12, which is uh, something that was written by Cynthia Hind, perhaps uh-huh. one of the whitest women in history. Oh, God. Um, so uh, on this on this map, we have a diagram showing the uh, the aerial school as a as a rectangle, uh, the playground as a weird like uh, kind of like a like a blob. It looks a blob. like a, a RuneScape empty pot. Yes. Yes. Um, then there's like grass and bush, there's power lines, there's the path, there's a, uh, a section that says landing area question mark and landing area, uh, as well. It's kind of funny. Um, yeah. So wait, so, so the landing area, there's the way this map, imagine, you know, you're looking at a rectangle and there's just an L shape that goes through it and that's where they're mapping out the power lines. Mm -hmm. The X by the landing area, are they saying something definitely, definitely? Something definitely did or did not land there because both of those are both true and make a stronger point. And then also something maybe didn't do or not land. I have no idea. Okay. (laughs) Honestly, I have no idea. I I thought I, I, in retrospect, I don't remember reading anything about that, but I also, um, I, I kind of skimmed this one because this is, this is like a later report. Right. Gotcha. Okay. Um, and it also repeated a bunch of shit that was in other reporting that I read. So I kind of just skipped it. Um, so based, as I mentioned before, based on my understanding, there isn't a consensus of what happened during the event. And I want to point out, and and this thing, was the thing I was pointing out, (laughs) even in Hin's original count, she highlights the dispute between children, whether or not the craft landed. Once the craft came to a rest, some 100 meters from the children, keep that in mind, uh, a small one meter man appeared at the top of the object, walked okay. towards the children, noticed them, and disappeared, reappearing on top of the craft. Their locomotion, the locomotion of this man, varied child to child, with one saying it moved as though it weren't affected by gravity, um, which is kind of a bizarre way of describing anything. Um, another men- uh, another thought, it were running in slow motion. Um, and the entity is said by one witness to have been dressed in a tight-fitting black suit, which was shiny, and as having long, scr- a long scrawny neck and huge eyes like rugby balls, right? And when I say... Okay. So I personally interpreted, like, rugby balls to be the shape. I think other people have interpreted it as being, like, rough, right? Like As like, rough? Like, like a fly's eye, right? Oh, gotcha. But I, I don't know. I don't remember reading that it was actually rough uh, anywhere. I would but... tend to interpret that as eye shape. I would be surprised if you could see texture at 100 meters. Yeah, yeah. No, that's... Well, that's the thing, right? They're very far away from this. They're they're a yeah. football field away, right? Yeah. I can... You can't really make out a whole hell of a lot of detail from a, a football field away. No. Even like if shiny, you're a kid. I buy shiny. Yeah, um, the, but... the the shiny, the suit, I can see all that. The shape, I can see that, right? But regardless. Um, anywho, so its face was also pale with long black shoulder-length hair. After the entity warped back to the craft, it, it took off abruptly, uh, disappearing from the children's sight, but not their mind. Throughout initial encounters, there are no indications of sound or communication with the aliens. Very important fact. Nowhere in the initial account do they mention anything about communicating with the aliens. Remember that. <laughs> gotcha. Because that's in fucking important. Now, notably, only children witnessed the crafts in the entity in the event. A mother of one of the students was president running a tuck shop, which is basically the school shore. However, gotcha. when the kids tried to get her, she refused because she did not want to leave the food and money behind. I miss school stores. Get those remember, cool pencils, those cool remember erasers. The, remember the floating pen that everyone lost their shit about? Oh, yeah, 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 where you could spin it? Yeah. yeah. That was one of those things that, like, everyone 
tried to get their hands on. I got one. It was fun. One. And and then I was kind of like, what am I going to do with this? I never use it as a pen. No, you just once. spin it. You just sit there in your bedroom and you spin it and you spin it and you spin it. And then you mess around with the like little plastic bit so you can kind of like control where it is. Yeah. Yeah. Is that um, and those pencils that were, uh, it was like an empty plastic pencil tube just filled with a bunch of pencil nibs and you'd mm-hmm. wear one down, push it in the back and another one would pop out front. And then if you lose one, you're fucked. Absolutely. <laughs> you lose one, the whole thing's unusable. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's great. It's awesome. It's a, it's a phenomenal design. It, it, it isn't completely wasteful in every way, shape, or form. No, oh, and then he could get those pencils where it was a colored pencil, but it was two colors. The left side was orange and the right side was green or whatever colors. I feel like, wasn't there like, uh, there were like temperature change pencils too, right? Ah, uh, maybe. I don't, if I, I don't, I don't think I ever got any of those. Oh, the, the bendy pencils, the rubber oh, yeah, bendy yeah, pencils, yeah. those were dope. Anywho, I don't think that this particular tuck shop had pencils. I think it was literally just food because I, uh. so this was during the recess, right? Um, which keep in mind this this was actually an early. You, if you remember the time, this is a very early recess, and there's a reason for that. Um, but getting back to this this woman who's doing the tuck shop, right? Uh-huh. Um, I personally think that this was a reasonable fear for her to not leave the food money behind. Yeah, right. Because I have a whole other theory for the event based on that. <laughs> Oh, it was a decoy for the kids to to go try to raid the snacks. I, I felt like (laughs) there's a part of me that fully believes that they like that. Like there's this part of me that's like, oh, they told somebody tried to fuck with this, this lady and, uh, they, uh, they failed. So then they just fucking doubled down. (laughs) Totally fair. That sounds like something I would have done. Yeah. Whatever. Um, but the actual faculty was inside of the school. Um, they, they, they didn't notice any deviation from the norm, uh, okay. of the, when it comes to the kids, because, you know, according to the headmaster, uh, the event lasted, uh, Colin Mackey, the event lasted a total of 10 to 15 minutes, um, which seems super long based on what we were talking about, right? Like the description I just gave doesn't sound like it's 10 to 15 minutes long. No. Right. Um, a lot of people will talk about this as being like weird timey wimey bullshit that aliens do, and like they also cite the fact that all these things are like things that aliens uh. are like pretty common amongst alien encounters and yada 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 and blah 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 blah. You know, you know what I'm saying, right? Where it's like, how could they have known all of that, this? Yeah, that's the thing that's annoying about um, alien re- just reporting around aliens in general is that anything that you go, what that anything. Any discrepancy or anything that doesn't quite make sense, they'll go, of course it doesn't make sense because it's aliens. So that because has to make aliens. our argument stronger. You know? Well, <laughs> I've been watching a lot of uh, a lot of videos about uh, young earth creationism uh-huh. um, because I found this this YouTuber called uh, Gutsy Gibbon. I posted it to the uh, to the discord. They went to yeah. the uh, the Ark Encounter in the Creation Museum. Uh-huh. And there's a really like so. There's a lot of problems with young earth creationism, right? We've uh-huh. covered some of them on this podcast, but one that we've never covered is the heat problem. Have you heard the of the heat, heat problem? No. Okay. So Brandon, um, when an element decays, right? Uh huh. Like when radioactive decay happens, what is one of the by- byproducts of radioactive decay? Do you happen to know? Uh, no. What is it? Heat? <laughs> energy? Yes. It's heat. It's energy. It's heat. Yeah. Which, because that's how fucking nuclear reactors work. Right? Yeah. Heat. Heat. It's heat. So, one of the contentions of the flood myth, uh, of people who ascribe to the flood myth as being reality, is that in that year that Noah was in the boat, uh-huh. all of that time, all of the radioactive decay happened simultaneously. But the problem, uh-huh. the problem is, we're talking about millions of, of years. Yeah. Right? Even billions of years. The amount of radioactive decay that would have to happen in that time frame would have literally vaporized the planet Earth <laughs> and turn it into and turn it into like a ball of plasma. Yeah. So So the excuse for that 
miracle, basically. Right? <laughs> it's kind of the same thing when it comes to aliens yeah. and talking about stuff like that. Yeah. Well, aliens, <laughs> of course. Um, yeah. It, it's, yeah. Oh, God. That's funny. But yeah, so the so, Earth would have been like, it, like dropping a turkey into just boiling oil. <laughs> like it would have just. Oh, that would have been that would have been the best case scenario. <laughs> uh, yeah, that that's best case scenario. Not even <laughs> like like in reality, nothing would be left standing. There would basically no. be burnt rocks. Um, but anywho. So this event had taken place during a faculty meeting, right? Which explains why none of the, the faculty were outside. Um, okay. Although it is a little bit weird that they didn't have anyone watching the children. I yeah, will say. Yeah, you would think you know, there'd be right? like a person. Yeah, because like the tuck shock lady, from what I understand, wasn't like, didn't have full view of the playground, right? Because like if she had full view of the playground, she would have seen something, but yeah. that didn't happen. So I don't know. Regardless... That's the circumstances that have been laid out before us, right? Um, so, after the call to action from the ZBC and BBC for reports regarding the sightings, the sighting flap, someone, I don't know who, from the aerial school had called to report on the events that day with Tim Leach, a BBC correspondent in Zimbabwe, uh, receiving the tip and getting in contact with his friend, Cynthia Hind, um, around 2 p.m., Cynthia Hind was the editor of UFO Afro News and then African representative of MUFON, which once again, the Mutual UFO Network. We they come up in a lot in our our, <laughs> uh, our alien discussions. Um, to say she was a believer in UFOs is what I would call a gross understatement. We should um, make a, a, a competing uh, a, a, an organization to compete with MUFON and just call it MUPAN. The UPA, Why unidentified aerial phenomena, a UAP, mu mu mupin, mupan, mupan, okay, mupan. I get what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I mean, the Center for Skeptical Inquiry is kind of like, oh, by yeah. definition, the opposite of of MUFON. Yeah. Um, uh, anywho, so uh, after hearing about the event, the pair arranged to visit the school that Monday to talk to the children. Leach also gets in contact with the Harvard psychiatrist, John Mack, MD. More on him in a moment. Um, over the weekend, Hind requests that the headmaster, Mackey, uh, requests of the headmaster, Mackey, that the children draw what they had seen prior to their arrival and gets in contact with the mother who had been in charge of the tuck shop and three students. Okay, so I want you to keep this in mind. This is very important to the storyline, right? Uh-huh. Um, it's Friday. Hind, keep in mind, this is 2 p.m. when Hind finds out, right? Yes. If you'll recall, elementary school, like, like the elementary school, this was a day that they had a faculty meeting, all sorts of stuff like that. So I yeah. have no idea when the, the, the elementary school let out, right? But what I, what I can assume is there wasn't enough time to actually draw these drawings, and we actually have evidence that the drawings weren't drawn on Friday, right? No, Which is well, that important. makes sense, right? <clears throat> because they've got the whole weekend. He didn't find out till later, so he wouldn't have been able to request they do that until. Mm -hmm. And and I want to point out that this this timeline events of events that was reconstructed. I'm using three dollar kit, which is one of the sources of this week's episode. Um, yeah, it's a blog made by I have his name right here, uh, Charlie Weiser. He has done extensive analysis of like everything so like okay phenomenal work um interesting interesting takes all that good stuff um so uh as far as we know they didn't immediately draw these drawings right yeah um which is important because one of the most frequently claimed thing one of the one of the frequently claimed things is that the drawings were done immediately after the event uh, okay and this is something that is this is something that is uh e parroted by last podcast on the left which is why in uh the discord i'm like oh, maybe take last podcast on the left a little like not seriously when it that. comes to yeah. ufo stuff uh because they operate under the assumption that this was like locked down fucking tight as tight can be right 
Yeah. Um, <clears throat> that there was no chance for the children to collaborate over the weekend or anything along those lines. Except the problem is in Cynthia Hinn's own reporting, uh, there was absolutely time for the children to collaborate over the weekend. There was. Because... So- she- Oh, I love last pod. Like I, I legit, I, I do like last podcast on the left a lot. But you have to take them. So they're not approaching things from like a skeptical point of view, but from a I want to believe and also like an entertainment point of view, mm-hmm. which makes it a very entertaining, good podcast, but not necessarily a reliable resource. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's why we. <laughs> That's why we have a 3.8 is because we don't approach this from an entertaining perspective. We approach this from a, uh, I'm going to be the fuddy duddy in the room and fuck you. Yeah. We're going to be a fuddy duddy. And then to break up the fuddy duddiness, we just talk about diarrhea pretty much and magic cards and uh, transformers. (laughs) Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but anywho, long story short, Hind does request them to draw it, but in requesting them to draw it, they aren't requesting them to draw it immediately after everything happens. Yeah. Because keep in mind, she only found out at 2 p Like, 2 p.m. was when she found out in the best, like, best case scenario yeah. timeline. Um, so that also leaves them four hours to talk amongst themselves. And I don't yeah. know if you remember being a kid in, like, <laughs> elementary school, Hell but yeah. four hours is like a fucking lifetime. It's a lot of time. Do you know how many rumors can get started in that time period? A oh, fuck yeah. a lot. Um, so, anywho, she also talks to the mother who is in charge of the, the tuck shop and three students, one of which was her child. Um, on Monday, Tim Leach visits the school, interviewing three witnesses and the headmaster around noon. Tuesday, Hind joins Leach and his film crew to investigate the happenings. So, laying this out, there are... Um, there are three encounters with individuals who had seen this prior, or two encounters with individuals who had seen this prior to uh, Hind showing up to do her interviews, right? So there's a yeah. bunch of chances for people to talk, be aware of what's going on, things along those lines. The drawings start on Monday and go into Tuesday, right? So there's a ton of time for things to change, right? Um, long story short, the cracks begin to form in this unassailable ufo site this most credible like whatever right Mm -hmm. because even to a casual reader right because like it's if you read it you know they have three days to ruminate imagine and potentially be to expose to ufo related content which is important and we'll talk about later um but the first interview was of three witnesses guy who's age 11 oriana and kaylee whose names weren't mentioned for some reason um uh um, so they mentioned they they interviewed three of them at once. Oh, which is a problem. Yeah, you don't so do that. I, you don't do that if you're trying to get like accurate accounting of an event, right? That's like child psychology 101, criminology 101. These are things like like a sociologist might do that because they're trying to understand, like if you're looking to understand the effects of like group and social dynamics, having a group of people talk is generally a good idea. And also if you can do a group of them and have inter- individual interviews prior to that, that's yeah. the best case scenario. Like that's the, that's the dream because then you can be like, okay, here's what their thoughts are. Here's how the group affects their thoughts. And then maybe even another one afterwards would be really good. Right. Yeah. So, Um, In this particular case, though, they're attempting to get an accurate reporting of events. And that's not how you get accurate reporting of events. You do not interview people in a group if you want to know what fucking happened. Because then you get people talking about leprechauns. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, For, for, like, like I said, this is contamination of the witness, right? Oh, yeah. Like. 150 fucking percent contamination of the witness. Um, in this additional account, the craft was described as silver, and at least one entity was spotted. One of the kids described the entity as follows. I saw this black, looks like a stick, but was very thin. A man? I don't know what it was, but it was very thin. All I saw was long, a long thing on a silver thing. <laughs> so that's that's very committal, right? Yeah. Um, when asked to describe the height, one of the kids indicated somewhere in the ballpark of five foot six. (laughs) 
<laughs> which, if you'll remember, when I was reading the MUFON report, a meter was used to describe the height of the creature. Oh, yes. Oh, and also that brief pause was John and I just really quickly doing some spelling corrections on the shared Google document. Shh, hide the... Hi, don't don't show behind the curtain, Brandon. They can't see that Oz is not a is not a great face, but a a small man behind the curtain. Oz doesn't know that F seven is spell check. So, the entity in this accounting also walked towards the the children and back towards the craft in opposition to the teleportation story mentioned in the Mufon version of events. So. The first interview does not align with the reporting that Cynthia Hind gave in her first write-up of this event. Gotcha. We have we have these we have like some tr- like the pers- the 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 three dollar kit uh, guy right um, Charlie Weiser he did he did like like um, transcribe these interviews and this is this is where I'm uh-huh. getting this information from was from his website that has transcriptions of the interviews and links to, to some of the videos all that sort of stuff stuff right um so we have we have like what she heard right and then she created this she produced this this thing out of this and it's a little bit like whatever right so um we have inaccurate like sizing um at some point i think one of the kids so they describe broadly speaking one of the kids describes him as michael the, the creature as michael jackson (laughs) <laughs> um, another person describes it as a Tolsheke, uh, Tolshki, which is like a, um, it's an African, like, pygmy zombie type thing. Yeah. Right? Um, which has an infinitely growing penis. Hell um, yeah. I- I'm not going to get into it because, like, it- it's it's not something that I thought. It's not something that I thought was super interesting because also the the UFOlogists don't make a big deal out of it. Although I will yeah. say one thing about it as we close the episode out, but we'll, we'll get there. Um, there's a lot to talk about on this episode, Brandon. Like a lot because like this is this is pretty much like the as a person who who studies human subjects. Yeah, Weird there's a say lot. That. There's a lot of problems with this like a lot they make some very bold claims that if i made i would get in trouble (laughs) so um to complicate things further one of the children interviewed kaylee indicated that there were actually three people present one white another red and the last black um okay basically initial accounting does not align with hin's published story whatsoever um, it gets worse when we start considering the interviews performed by Hind, right? So the these these initial ones were the Lee uh the Leech interviews, right? Where he yeah. was talking to them. Now we get into uh Hind's interviews, right? Um, in the weekend interviews, the descriptions vary even more. With one description describing the craft as white and another as golden. Um, uh, things get go yeah. really off the rails when Hin begins interviewing students in person. To begin, seven students are interviewed at once in the school staff room. Oh, good. Seven. Um, the students were the oldest in the school, who were in grade seven, placing them at about 12 years old, right? Um, here, the narrative recounted in the MUFON recount, account more or less begins to take shape. However, there are a few interesting details that Hind elected to keep out of her reporting. Um, the first one is that one of the students said they thought the alien was the school gardener at first glance. Huh. The second, and more damning, is that the kids expressed an awareness of UFOs and aliens. Uh, what did you think it was? I don't know. I just thought it was some kind of alien from a different planet. So you know about UFOs? Yes. You've watched them on television? Yes. You think that interview influenced you? Mm, or, were you or weren't you thinking about it when you... I wasn't thinking about it. So Brandon, right there... That 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 interview technique is bad. Very, oh. very, very, very bad. Okay? She didn't allow her subject to finish her thought and interrupted her with the negative as they're talking. Because if someone's going, mm, and, like, talking about that, like, I give them a second. Yeah. Let, I them, have th- a, let them think. 
I've got a multi-part alien uh, episode in, in, in on the books, and um, the interviewer on that one did much worse than this even. On top of having multiple, um, having siblings in a room being interviewed at the same time, um, instead of just asking, what was basically putting ideas into to their heads with the questions. Like, I mean, like putting new putting new information out there with the question that they had never mentioned previously. Oh, Brandon, don't worry. Oh, God, is that coming up? Oh, don't worry. I mean, we've oh, already no. seen a little bit of it because the oh, or you weren't thinking about it is kind of explicitly doing that. Yeah, because right? it's providing them an out. Right. It's providing them an out for the story. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. But the, the, so, at least they were like. You didn't feel like it was uh, trying to poison you, did you? Like, they weren't, <laughs> like, putting yeah. that kind of shit yet. Oh, but it gets least. worse. It oh, definitely good. gets worse. So the last question is what I would typically describe as a leading question. Um, yeah. The use of a negative in the question seeds the response that Hind wanted to hear. People, children especially, want to be right when answering questions like this and will adjust their answers to meet the expectations of their interviewers, Right. Um, what's more egregious, however, is that Hind has the audacity to say the following uh, in one of the interviews she gave on the subject. I believe what they saw. I think perhaps they might be, uh, some might have been influenced by others, but like basically, yourself. <laughs> they drew many of their drawings that I don't think they could know about. It gets worse in her sightings interview, where she says, well, a lot of these children go don't go to the movies. They live in the countries. Parents are farmers. Now... <clears throat> I want to take a moment, Brandon. You know what they say about farmers? It's well known they hate movies. Yes, they're the, they, they, <laughs> they are the fucking hate them. Hate them. Hate them. <laughs> um, this is not accurate. First of all, um, yeah. it's completely ridiculous that she would say this because at least one of the students literally and explicitly mentions, and we even said it. Prior exposure to UFOs and awareness. Moreover, the terms aliens and UFOs are used in the interviewers without the interviewers describing them first. Um, in fact, some of the students have been discussing UFOs in their classroom prior to the events. Prior oh, to this good. event. So they had been discussing UFOs and talking about them because, hey, remember that fucking giant flap that was happening that was on the goddamn radio? Yeah. <laughs> well, this is also um, in, in, and we've done um, different uh, episodes in, in and around Zimbabwe. I think I've got one, another one on the books, actually, in, in this area. This is a common thing in this time period. Like, it's happening rather frequently. Yes, there is actually a pretty high rate of these types of things. And there's also, um, there's also, like... Uh, Goblins uh, and UFOs are, are, are the two most common things yeah. in well, this area during this time period. There's there's also a, a rash of mass hysteria that's like happening amongst yeah. elementary school students, which I I personally don't like to to lean on that too much because I think the concept of mass hysteria can be kind of misused. Um, yeah, but like because I think I think there's more structural problems to this beyond mass hysteria, yeah. right? Um, but you know it's a thing, so. Page Master just came out, by the way, in this time period. Oh, it did. It did. It didn't did. It? And the mask. That is... Page Master, I think, is the better movie of the two. That might uh, be controversial. Yeah, I, I I like the mask. Does the mask have Christopher Lloyd in it and Macaulay Culkin as a cartoon character? Does yeah. Christopher Lloyd voice adventure? Is Christopher Lloyd still Christopher Lloyd? What do you mean? Um, like he's is he still just like a vampire in in Page Master? He's a librarian. No, I mean, and nope, he's still alive. No, what again is Christopher Lloyd's been? Oh yeah, he hit he's max been level and never seventy for like the last forty years. Yeah, he hit max level. Like, I'd argue fifty fifty years. Um, <laughs> yeah, he hit max level and then just didn't move. Uh, Michael yeah, J. Fox. <laughs> Michael J. Fox aged way, way worse than him. But to be fair, he does have Parkinson's. So like, say, yeah, he on account of Parkinson's. <laughs> yeah. Um. Anywho. Anywho. Uh, I should also note, Brandon. Local television schedules have been uncovered, indicating that there was a litany of UFO-related contact. Some of which described crafts matching the descriptions a number of the students had. Oh, perfect. Yes. To make matters even worse, 
Describing the parents of the school as farmers is reductive and absolutely take av- takes advantage of the prejudice on part of the reader, right? Because because yeah. we're talking about Zimbabwe, right? Um, it feels a little a little racist to be like, oh, they're just podunk farmers, right? Because um, here's the facts. As I mentioned before, the Ariel School was a very private school, and when I say very private, I mean expensive fucking yeah. expensive private school it had a competitive swimming pool tennis courts and even a fucking golf course brandon oh damn it's no surprise that the families were generally wealthy and on top of that they were generally uh missionaries yeah so a lot of these kids didn't like a lot of these kids moved to zimbabwe gotcha which means also they went they had to go through uh airport terminals some of them were from yeah. canada you know what book was already published at this point and might have been in an airport uh terminal or two no wait 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 whitley, wait, wait no tell me whitley streber's communion which has a, oh. a gray alien on the front of it that has yeah. uh the almond shaped eyes oh which you might be able to describe as rugby shaped in some yeah. some some versions of it um but wait brandon it's worse because rua uh, I didn't mention this because I didn't want to, like, kind of give away the ghost on this one. Uh-huh. Uh, is not that far away from Z- the capital city of Zimbabwe. Uh, Harare. So the travel time from the center of Harare to the aerial school is a modest one hour. With him oh. herself noting it was a mere 20 kilometers away from Harare. And I want to uh-huh. point out, I did that today. Dropping a pin <laughs> from the aerial school to yeah. the center of Harare. Right, and Harare uh-huh. is a city with a sprawl, so it's not just like straight to the center of Harare, and you you're at a place that has movie theaters and shit like that. Yeah. Right, I was giving you the longest possible like version, and not only that, I think I ran it during rush hour. <laughs> so like, <clears throat> moving beyond the sightings, Hind visited the, the site with Gunter Hofer. Hofer. Um, who took readings of the alleged site using a homemade Geiger counter in 1994. Jesus Christ. I don't really even know what that me. means. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know either. It sounds weird, but... Um, like, how do you do that yourself? I'm sure there's a way. I'm sure you There's did a way. It. There's got to be a way to do it, but... Geiger counters, I guess, don't were... don't do that. <laughs> yeah, I guess they were super expensive in Africa, so they made a homemade one. I think um, they're probably super expensive in general, but still, if you know you're going to be in an area with radiation, don't trust your shit from Radio Shack, you know? No, <laughs> no. I wouldn't. Um, but Brandon, there was no physical evidence to be found at the time, despite a later oh, account claiming to have a photo of a landing mark. Okay. Mm-hmm. And that photo resurfaced? Uh, I saw it. It's, I don't think it's worth oh, saying okay. anything about. It, it looked dumb. Um, so... I mentioned it in passing. Well, not really in passing. I, I kind of hammered this home pretty hard, actually, because I didn't have it. I mentioned it in passing in the in the the, the show notes in my, my yeah. script, but I really hit it hard when I was talking. Um, a major factor in this case is considering the drawings made by the students three days after the sighting. The core claim is that there were no collaboration amongst the students, but... As we mentioned before, I was in elementary school in the 90s, and I can immediately tell you that this is 100% unfiltered bullshit. (laughs) It did not take long for people to have, like, scuttlebutt moves so quick in an elementary school. It's kind of terrifying. Oh, yeah. Like... It's insane. It was quicker. You could... you. I heard rumors quicker in elementary school than I did in high school. That's absolutely true. (laughs) Like I, you, you knew more shit like that was going down on the ground in elementary school than in high school. Oh, my kindergarten teacher died yesterday. R.I.P. Miss Clausy. Oh, that's sad. <laughs> yeah. Um. <laughs> wow that 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 derailed me for a second. <laughs> I saw your face. Cause like I'm like, uh, uh, do I just keep going? Or do I? Do I respond to that? Because, like, what do I do? I don't know this person. Um, anywho, Hinn notes her reasoning. 
I made several phone calls. One of them was to Colin Mackey, headmaster of the aerial school, and I suggested he arrange to have the children draw pictures of what they had seen before they had time to discuss it amongst themselves. As noted by Charlie Weiser of $3 Kit, they all had that Friday afternoon to talk about the story. Moreover, when interviewing one of the children over the weekend, she said she had been with her friends from school. As kids because, do. Because, you know, kids don't, elementary school kids don't hang out on the weekend ever. Ever. And don't have, like, play dates and shit. They just go That's back not into thing. their pods until Monday. Yep. Um, so there's also one of the... I have one of the drawings, which is a screenshot from uh, a movie called the... Um, what was it? The Aerial School Phenomena? I talk about it a little bit more depth. The Aerial, aerial Phenomena, uh, which is like... Um, uh, uh, it, it's, it's it's a screenshot of a scanned copy of a, of a drawing. Actually, yes. the quality, I'm laughing because of the situation, but it is actually rather high quality for, for no, it's, what it it's, is, all things considered. Well, what happened in the in the actual movie, uh, it's a photocopy of her per, that, per, that person's drawing, the person whose hands yeah. are there. Um, I talk about it a little bit more in more depth, I think, in a minute. Um, I didn't Those mention that I watched that school hands? Well. No, that's that's adult hands. Oh, okay. I was gonna. I was this gonna say, is, those look like this adult is, hands. This is like uh, in 2015. So oh, like, oh, gotcha. This is yeah. After like this the is event. like 20 years later. Gotcha. That okay. This this picture was taken. Um, even still, collaboration aside, uh, the drawings are really only similar in that they're UFOs or alien-like beings. I want to take a moment to point out that the. Uh, uh, the drawing that I have here very much looks like the day the Earth stood still. Oh, uh, like, yeah. Like, you know, the, the scene where the, the flying saucer is, uh, 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 um, is like landing and the dude is walking out. You know, it's it's kind of an iconic, like, scene from movie history, right? Um, oh, yes. I'm, I'm talking about the 1951 version of the film. Yeah. Not, not the newer one. Um, it's, it's, it's kind of infamous and like, it's entirely possible that like, that this could have been, that this could have entered into their consciousness, right? Cause there's like this scene of Klaatu, who's the alien from that movie walking out on a silver spaceship, you uh-huh. know, it's, 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 it's iconic. Right. Oh, hey, that's very similar to some of these. <laughs> oh, like, very similar to some of these pictures. Yeah. So, like, um, did you know that the uh, the Necronomicon, uh, the words that are read in the Necronomicon from uh, uh, Evil Dead, the Evil Dead are from are from uh, the the day the Earth stood still. No, I didn't know that. That's some fun movie trivia. Yeah, they they took it. What was it? The Condar Klaatu. Uh, I don't know. I always forget it. Verita Nikto. There we go. <laughs> I'll believe it. You you of all people, you could have said anything. I and I know you, and I'd be like, that's that's true. That's Klaatu Barada Nikto. That's it. Okay. That's the that's the thing from the day the Earth stood still. Did you see the new one? No, I haven't seen it. I haven't seen it either. I'm not sure. It it looks. I it's. I miss the campiness. It looks like the camp is gone. I mean, I really liked the remake, um, with uh, the Lady Ash. So. Oh yeah, I, I enjoyed that one. I did that enjoy really that one. one. That was a really good one. Um, regardless, so most of these crafts are extremely generic, looking like flyer saucers from a 1960s movie. Um, additionally, the aliens are very much in the line with Whitley Strieber's co- communion gray alien, as I mentioned before. Mm-hmm. Uh, the differences in these stories are used by Hind, as I mentioned once again before. I, 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 I say a lot of this stuff out of out of turn because I'm I'm very... Even though I, I, I wrote this like two weeks ago now, I'm yeah. very, very... This, this story has been living in my head rent-free. <laughs> um, so I want to get it out. Uh, so... The difference in the stories are used as hint, by Hind as evidence that an event happened, taking Rashomon to its logical conclusion. Because, <clears throat> and this is a direct quote from her, if they tell exactly the same story, then there's corroboration. If no. they've got together and they're doing it. But if they tell a similar story from different viewpoints, to me, that's the truth. Now, <sighs> I will concede identical stories 
might indicate corroboration. Collaboration, it, it, right? It, it, it could mean. It may yes. mean. But it doesn't yes. always mean. Correct. Um, <laughs> but when you're dealing with a range of children it, ages 6 to 12, 6 to fucking 12, it is a bad faith argument to say that corroboration it, is identical storytelling. It, it could also mean that uh, they saw the same thing. If, if multiple people, that, that could also be what that, also 6 to 12, that's wild. Right. They're children. They're when babies. When I was six, I was like, shit. Like, to me, I was like 12. Like, you don't even talk to a fucking 12-year-old because they're like, they're damn near an adult and they're scary. <laughs> oh, 12-year-olds can be scary, yeah. They're, well, 12-year-olds, from the actually, I have a six-year-old. 12-year-olds are really scary, actually. That is the scariest age. Oh, is that right before the puberty? That's, that's like, as puberty is happening. Oh, God. That's middle schooler is what that is. Yeah, they're sticky for a different reason. Middle school middle school is the scariest time to encounter a child, in my uh, opinion. They are... There's something else that happens when you're in middle school. <laughs> I'd rather deal with a high schooler than a middle schooler. Full That's stop. That's fair. Um, I liked middle school because we got to get the king-sized pretzels with the cheese from the high school pretty frequently, because that was, that was fun. I don't remember that. Oh, anytime there was a bomb threat, we had to go. Oh, to the high yeah, school, that happened a lot. Though. And they had the nice uh, pretzels there, but that happened a lot. So every time there was like a bomb threat, I was more like, "Yes, How pretzels." Many, we got like six or seven bomb threats in one year. It was frequent enough where, it, like, I feel like it wasn't it's just about me. time for another bomb threat. <laughs> like people would, like kids would, like as soon as you would hear the stuff start, and they'd start following you into the the the, the hallway. People just, like, the first couple maybe were scary. After that, people just start talking about, oh, we're going to get the high school lunch. We're going to get the high school. Like, people honestly, got excited for it. Honestly, Brandon, once that happened, I was like, sweet, I have time to work on homework. <laughs> <laughs> also fair, get that done at school before you get home. That means you've got so much more time for activities. That's another good way to look at it, though. I, I was like, fuck yeah, I got time to work on homework. And you know what? Not for nothing, those bomb threats were really good because by the time we got to high school, they tried to make things a little healthier and they got rid of the king-sized pretzels. They did. They did. So if it wasn't for those, I wouldn't have had such well, you wouldn't so have, much nacho cheese. <laughs> you wouldn't have known what you were missing. I wouldn't have known what... Yeah. It's true. Yeah. Um... So, after Hind and Leach completed their initial round of inquiry, other news organizations came to the school. I won't go into depth about these interviews, but the story predictable mutates at this point. The color of the ship varies from witness to witness. A flute-like noise was audible during the event. Some figures had hair, others didn't. And at one point, one of the students was a meter away from the oh, aliens. God. They went from 100 <laughs> meters so to one. a meter. So, oh, good. Yeah. Um... However, the most interesting of these changes is the notion that the aliens wanted to communicate that something is going to happen. Okay. Okay, um, so we've gone which from honestly, the absolutely no communication to now they're they're here to, to save us. Which, now that I think about it, kind of uh, talking about bomb threats kind of like dovetails nicely to that. Oh, no. <laughs> um, Something's going to happen. You're going to get nacho cheese. Don't come come in on Monday. Um, did you have you ever seen the the like uh, bowling uh, meme videos where like it's 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 like a a bowling ball getting bullied by a bunch of pins. No, and the a, one of the pins like tries to stop the other pins from bullying the bowling ball, and then like they go to their locker and they open up the the locker and there's like a note that says "Don't come in on Sunday," and then across <laughs> the screen it's uh, on Monday and across the screen it says "Spared." <laughs> um. Anywho, so here John Mack enters the story proper. Doctor John. Oh God! Mack I just got that. Yeah. <laughs> They um, should, oh gosh. All right, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to go to Patel's. We're going to uh, change the, the animation videos that plays over the bowling alley to just be those videos and see how long it takes anyone to notice. Is Patel's what they call Hobo now? Um, Yes. Okay. I want to say yes. They have laser tag. It's fun. 
Do they? Nice. Dave laser tag and a bar. I'm just going to throw that out there. <laughs> I, Brandon, most bowling alleys have a bar. Like, bowling is a bar is a is a sport that involves alcohol when you're an adult. <laughs> If it doesn't involve alcohol, you're not technically playing. You're not technically bowling at that point. You're just throwing yeah. a ball. Yeah. Um. Anywho, so I want to get into John Mack. Uh, Dr. Sure. John Mack was a tenured Harvard academic scientist who's had a bit of an obsession with aliens. Um. In 1994, he published a book, Abduction: Human Encounters with Aliens, with that recounted case studies of abduction that he had gathered. Um. He began to diverge quite a bit from his original field, the psychiatric study of child psychology. Um, psychiatry and biographies of Florence of Arabia. He literally has a biography, huh? like a psychological biography of Lawrence of Arabia. What? Um, it's a thing. It's a hundred percent a thing. It's bizarre to me, but it's a thing. Um, the desert divergence was so great, in fact, that he was actually being investigated by Harvard at the time of the Aerial School in a faculty inv- investigation for standards of conduct. His lawyer on retainer described a draft proposal of this investigation as follows. Um, The draft report finds it is professionally irresponsible for any academic, scholar, or practicing psychiatrist to give any credence whatsoever to a personal account report of direct personal contact between human being and extraterrestrial being, being until after the person has been subjected to every possibly available battery of standard psychological tests which might conceivably explain the report as the product of some known form of clinical psychosis to communicate in any way whatsoever to a person who might as might, who has reported a close encounter with an extraterrestrial life form um, that this experience might well have been real is professionally irresponsible. I would agree with that statement. (laughs) Um, Long story short, Mac, who is absolutely a uh, proponent of regression therapy, you know, the thing, Uh the thing responsible for the satanic panic yeah. in like uh like created memories and all that sort of stuff yeah oh what's um, the name of that oh gosh the name of that girl are you are, which one are you talking about the uh, the so and so remembers oh gosh uh, i think we we i know we talked about it i'm drawing the biggest blank there was a person doing regressive therapy oh. on a girl and essentially like I don't know if they were, she was implanting ideas into her or just, ah, uh, I'll remember it later. There's, there's a, there's a, a, there's, a there's a famous woman who's still like operating in that, uh, capacity. I forget, I forget whose name it was. They, they covered her on, um, was it Sybil? No, Sybil's different. Sybil's uh split personality. Oh, gotcha. Is, yeah. That, that was another like, um, uh, another thing the the book uh michelle remembers was the name of the book um which is like kind of famous like made it famous right um which was like completely inaccurate right um it was written by the woman's husband all sorts of stuff like that uh there was the whole mcmartin preschool trial blah 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 yada 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 you know there's there's a bunch there's actually so there's something interesting here right Uh um Last podcast on the left actually has a really, really, really good series about the Satanic Panic, um, which is kind of funny, <laughs> um, because in there talking about like this particular uh, uh, a story, right? Yeah, they talk about um, the Satanic Panic, and um, when they're talking about the Satanic Panic in this, they're like. Oh no, that's this this is not like like the satanic panic because the kids weren't given like, you know, prizes or, you know, rewards or anything yeah. like that. Um but I'll get into it in a second. They absolutely were given rewards. Um but <laughs> it's not in the way that people think of rewards. Rewards gotcha. when it comes to interviews and like psychological grounding and things along those lines, rewarding someone is not necessarily giving them physical, tangible objects. Yeah. Um Gratif- users humans users positive feedback I, yes positive feedback is very important um personal gratification is very important uh it, it's something that comes up in my personal work a bunch right um the sense of like belonging the sense of uh, uh of like the social pressures and things along those lines very important extremely yeah. extremely important um 
There was another. I, now I'm I'm trying to think of the woman. This is this is killing me. There's there's a woman in, uh uh in like. Arizona. Yeah, I think I think that's where the person is. She's operating in Arizona. She's still doing stuff. Um. Oh fuck. She's like. Uh, is it Lisa? No. Uh, no. Uh, God damn it. Is it Alice God Miller? No. Um, this is going nowhere. This is really great radio. Um, <laughs> it, the, she was in, uh, she was on an uh, episode. They, they talked about her on on rack. Barbara snow. Oh, okay. That's her. That's who it is. Okay. Yep. 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 Uh, she's a, she's a therapist based out of Salt Lake city. Um, and one of the central figures in the satanic ritual abuse, moral panic in Utah. Um, she's done some very, 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 very bad stuff. She was put on probation in 2008 because she was doing bad shit. Um, (laughs) involving, you know, telling people that they were, you know, victims of SA and stuff like that. Um, anywho, uh, long story short, getting back to Mac, um, he was being accused of effectively psychiatric malpractice, um, Ultimately, however, due to his tenured status, there was some outcry from the academic community, namely Alan Dershowitz of Harvard Law. Now, have you ever heard of Alan Dershowitz? It's probably a name you've heard of. I I, I may have heard it. Looking at the parentheses down below, he's got to have his name's has to have had popped up on some like behind the bastard somewhere. (laughs) You've definitely heard his name for sure. Yeah. Um, so, oh no. <gasps> oh God, he has a hot take about the Trump stuff. Oh, good. Um, okay, <laughs> so he's a Harvard Law uh, professor um, who's a known defender of assholes, including, and not limited to, uh, Julia Assange, Harvey Weinstein and Donald Trump. And Uh he is a proponent of torture. uh, As long as you have a warrant, he has faced no consequences. Although, um, sorry, Mac faced no consequences. Although his Uh methods were censured by the community. Um, Going back to Alan Dershowitz, however, uh, it's okay. If you defend assholes, right? Because public defenders are a thing, right? There are people who are defending people who are, uh, have done things, right? That's a part yeah. of law. We need people who defend the people who have done the thing, right? Yeah. Because everyone should be entitled to a trial, a, 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 a just trial, one that is not a miscarriage of justice. The laws are followed, you know, all the stuff, right? Because, you know, we we don't have a great legal system. No. Without, without having somebody to defend and, like, navigate the system for you, you won't have proper representation, and there's a good chance that, like, the law will fail you. Um, that being said, he is not a public defender. He made the choice to <laughs> defend Julian Assange, Harvey Weinstein, and Donald Trump. Yeah. Like, these are personal decisions. <laughs> So my my empathy for him only goes about 2 inches. Yeah. Um also he says that uh Donald Trump can um dodge most of the indictment apart from one thing. Uh, and this is the uh let's see. He read it very carefully. Um only one page has anything of substance to it. The stuff about moving boxes, that's all covered by the Presidential Records Act. Probably not criminal at all. The one page of concern, obviously, if true, is the tape recording that was made of a conversation ex-President Trump had with a writer who was writing a book about Meadows, which he said, look, I have all these documents. They're secret. I could have declassified them when I was president, but I didn't. Uh, and then it either shows it to him or shows him that he has it. Um, yeah. To me, that makes that means that everything is fucked because he could have declassified them, but didn't um, and decided to... You know, yeah, 
branch Anywho. doesn't set the 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 um Anywho. He, he couldn't do that. <laughs> Long story short, Alan Dershowitz is an asshole. Um That's all. The 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 people who can set like export and and uh and uh, the, classify things as controlled information is the Department of Commerce and the Department of Defense. Other branches don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Other departments if... don't do that. <laughs> um, so we meant you mentioned behind the passwords. I just have like a moment. Um, oh, I only said that because I'm I I can't recall Alan Dershowitz, oh, but I'm defended... sure he's come up on a behind the bastards episode. He a defended times. Gilsane Maxwell as well. Oh, good. Yeah, and he he uh says that Obama will go down in history as one of the worst foreign blah 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 and defended defending Trump. Um I don't know. <laughs> Erectile dysfunction what? is associated with him? I don't know. Whatever. Um so talking about behind the bastards, uh he's recently been doing a a bit talking about the chain. Uh which, for those of you who don't know, is a Fleetwood Mac song that is pretty fucking good. Um, and they've been making so many Fleetwood Mac jokes that when I was like, I was like, man, I want to listen to The Chain while I was listening to an episode. So I paused yeah. the episode, typed into my, my Spotify search, The Chain, and yeah. like the fifth result was Behind the Bastards. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anywho. It's against this backdrop that uh, John Mack visited the aerial school in December of that year. Keep in mind, it happened in September, and he's visiting December. This is three months, right, um, to talk to the students. Yeah. Here, the aliens gained motives. It turns Ooh. out that their purpose for visiting was to send a message communicated through the aliens' evil eyes. Supposedly, the aliens were here to warn students about pollution. Interestingly... John Mack was an anti-nuclear and environmental activist, and there was no complete transcripts or recording of the interviews that had been released to the public. Huh. Uh-huh. Interesting, right? Very interesting. Mm-hmm. So, I want to take a moment to note that despite the common reporting that 62 children had seen the craft, um, Hind only interviewed around 10 to 12 students initially. Okay. Uh, John Mack would also interview a group of 12 students in which there was overlap between the two groups. Also, what's typically not mentioned when discussing this event is that there were 200 students who did not witness a fucking thing. Huh. 200 people. They were just facing the wrong thing, direction. Apparently. Um, Mac is frequently mentioned as one of the elements that increases the credibility of the event, being a tenured professor. However, to my knowledge, his findings regarding the aerial school were never peer-reviewed and released in a book five years after the event. And this book, Passport to the Cosmos, has shockingly little about Mac's methodology and only mentions the aerial school in passing, with only about three pages total dedicated to the case. Uh, checking out work cited by Mac, an article by Dominique Kalinopis, his co-investigator, um, little is added to the discourse on the subject. Academically speaking, if these articles and books were given to me as a reviewer, I would categorically reject them because they don't properly contextualize any other work methodology methodologically, nor do they do it in an academic like literature context, right? I would yeah. basically just be like, this is fucking worthless. What are you doing? Yeah. Right? Um, I don't know what you did. I have no idea how to evaluate your your technique. I have no idea how to evaluate your your methodology. You're basically there's there's nothing there's no reason I should give this I have any confidence that you have done the correct thing when doing yeah. this. Um so uh Cynthia Hind also wrote a book, UFOs Over Africa, uh, but I couldn't find a copy for any kind of reasonable price. Um but based on the snippets I've read, we're not missing a whole heck of a lot <laughs> when it comes to that. Um, doesn't look like it's that great of a book. Uh, a more valuable manuscript, however, was penned by Giles Ferdinand Fernandez, a PhD in cognitive psychology, um, which was written in 2016, dissecting the data gathering techniques employed by both Hind and Mac. Hind's two major sins manifest in the fact that she did not respect the subject's free narration. This is something that I mentioned earlier. Um, basically, when conducting a qualitative interview, the investigator 
uh, should only ask questions about the subject's memory and recall, right? Um, yeah. Which is really important, right? You're not supposed to ask them to editorialize. You're not supposed to ask them to assign meaning or whatever to it. Just tell me what you heard, what you saw, what you heard, what you perceived. Tell me yeah. that, right? I'm not going to ask any questions that attempt to elaborate or whatever, because if I ask those questions, by nature, I am modifying the story. Um, the, su- the subject, in this case, the child, question their questions should not be asked um, in general because they can very easily lead to the content lead the content of the recollection. Um, after their initial recall is gathered, however, investigators may then ask questions. Right? This is the this is the way that we do this kind of research. Right? Yeah. You ask someone to give their experience and then you know let them go. Um, the second sin, as I mentioned before, uh, is that Hind interviewed the witnesses collectively and not individually. Um, however, interviews were lo- roughly linear going down the row as uh, the other children were able to listen to the accounts of their peers. Those who say the children had no rewards for telling the story neglect the social gratification afforded in this fitting uh, in fitting in, right? In yeah. continuing the story. There is a massive, massive, massive benefit socially to conform in this regard, oh, yeah. or at least reinforce what your peers say, right? Um, calling your peer a liar is not going to win you any, any favors or anything, right? Yeah. Regardless, um, to some, this might actually even be a ludic experience, right? And this is something that I talk about because I study, you know, location-based games and locative media and things along those lines, uh, because it gives the, Player, the students the chance to engage in something called Ilnex, which we talked about um, on a previous episode when we talked about the Slender Man, right? This, yes. This deceiving, this this whirlwind, it's this, it's this, uh, you know, trying to deliberately mislead, right, or like create these things. It's not malicious necessarily, but it's to create this like narrative. It's it's like um, uh, it's 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 almost like a a, a more directed form of Mad Libs, so to speak. Yeah. Um, the consequence of this technique is that the students inherently collaborate uh, at this point in, to tell a, tell a story in rounds, no matter how much they saw, right? No matter what they saw. Um, and even if the children had seen something, this testimony is polluted by this technique, make, make, making it functionally worthless as evidence. It's valueless, completely valueless data. Um, Mac is no better than Hind, in my opinion, and Fernandez's. Uh, he also leveraged his group interviews as clearly seen in the Aerial Phenomena documentary and interviews with a free testimony of subjects. Worse, however, is the lack of rigor in Max questioning. As I noted above, when conducting interviews, subjects have a tendency to acquiesce and conform to the desires of the interviewer. Um, as a result, interviewers' languages should not be leading and abo- avoid confirmatory yes and no in multiple choice questions because they restrict responses uh, that can be offered by a participant and biases them more towards positive answers, right? Because once again, we're getting into social gratifications, right? People yeah. want to want social gratification. They want to be like, I made my, my uh, interviewer happy. This guy's a PhD. This guy is smart. I made him happy and did what he wanted me to do. Yay, right? Like, even if you aren't aware of that, it's subconsciously there, right? You want to... It, it, it is a thing. It is 100% a thing. It's a thing that I have to be aware of when I do my analyses. Oh, God. I might have to do my alien episode soon. I'm sorry, because you're going to lose your shit if, the, if this oh, is I'm how you going with just the little snippets I have above. I, 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 I want to point out, Brandon... I want to point out, most of this is talking about their methodologies. This <laughs> entire this entire episode is talking about how they fucked up, and less about what actually happened. Yeah, yeah. but this um, interviewer, even though they didn't say, it, even though the 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 subject didn't bring anything up, the interviewer didn't then ask a question saying, "Do you believe these were sent from God?" <laughs> Pretty much. There's a lot of that in my alien episode. Oh boy. <laughs> there is actually a correct way of asking that question. Um and the correct way of asking that question is what do you think the origin of these things were? See, you could ask that, but then you don't ask a follow-up question saying, 
did they take you onto their ship? <laughs> uh, Even yeah, though the no. subject never mentioned anything about that previously. Yeah, well, that's <laughs> that's getting into the uh, that's getting into the, the the free narration, right? Yeah, um, you're you're violating free narration and all that kind of stuff. Anywho, anywho, anywho. Um, <laughs> so, likewise, Mac has a tendency to use words in uh, like imagine or think in their interviews, which is generally not something you do when you list when you want to elicit uh, accurate testimony from children. If yeah. you ask them to imagine, they will fucking imagine, and that's not helpful. <laughs> Yeah, especially um, children. Everyone knows children famously don't have wild imaginations. Famously. Um, however, I do want to take a second, Brandon, to say um, that uh, the failings of the investigators do not preclude the fact that uh, the children saw nothing, right? There's, there's, in fact, it is likely that something acted as a stimulus for the children in the event, Um Right, I, I personally am of the belief, and I think I've talked about this on the podcast before, um, that I don't think people necessarily make things up out of malice. Right, yeah. I don't think people make things up completely whole cloth. Right, um, there is hoaxing, but I think a lot of the time people are genuine in their in what they're saying. Right, there, there was a um, seed somewhere. Yeah, it, it there's people might be, like for example me. Right, when I was younger. I believed that uh, I saw a UFO at one point. Yeah. I believe that I saw fucking Santa Claus in the house because I saw like a weird, like my brain misfired when I was like half awake and I thought I saw a face yeah. at the foot of my bed. Right. Um, and it was, it was Christmas. And you went so, like, straight to Santa. Okay. It was Christmas. Okay. I was it was say, Christmas. It was Christmas. Santa instead of Christmas. It demon. was Christmas. It was okay. specifically Christmas. So, so these contextual things happen and people believe these things. Children believe these things because of something that they see. And yeah. whether or not that thing is actually the thing or has any relation to the thing is a whole other matter entirely. Um, I've been playing through the Doom games recently, right? Uh -huh. I'm currently on Doom 64. Um, and when I was younger, the first game that I played was Ultimate Doom, right? Yeah. Uh, or Doom 95. It was one of the two. I don't recall. Um and I have this memory of a level, right, in Doom. And I've played through pretty much every officially released level at this point. I can't find that level. But yeah. I have an extremely vivid memory of that level and how it was laid out. Because that level is responsible for, like, one of my first memorable nightmares because of the fucking imps in Doom. Yeah, the fucking You know, the imps. Chewbacca-looking motherfuckers. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I have an extremely vivid memory of this level, what the, what the layout was, like what happens in the level that triggered this, this nightmare. Yeah. I played through the entire game, all the secret levels. I couldn't find that level anywhere. Brandon, I saw something because yeah. it's similar to what happened to the game, but I didn't, I, I mis misremembered it. Right. Yeah. And that's just like a very basic example of this. And I didn't have somebody ask me, hey, John, what was that nightmare about that you had in Doom? Yeah. Like, what was the thing that caused that nightmare you had in Doom? I haven't even really talked about it all that often over the years. Right. Um, Like maybe once every like two or three years, I'll talk about it because it was, you know, it was like my first memorable nightmare. Right. Yeah. Um, so sometimes it just comes up like when I'm talking to my parents or something like it's like, hey, remember when that thing happened with me? Blah, 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 blah. Right. Yeah. Um, so. Even simple, mundane bullshit things, we have these memories that are not necessarily accurate. Right. But. That doesn't mean that there wasn't a C, there wasn't a, an initial thing, right? Because uh -huh. when we're getting into, like, the notion of, like, repressed memories and stuff like that, it's like, oh, you repressed that memory. But that's not true. That's not how memory works. You'll still remember that there was something associated yeah. with it, right? Whether you remember it correctly or not, that's a whole other thing. There's not just, like, gaps in your memory that occur. Because, whatever. Uh -huh. Not not the point of this episode, but <laughs> regardless. Um... So, when it comes to possible explanations, uh, they range from things like dust devils and weird-looking trees uh -huh. to a traveling puppet show uh, that put on a show for the children. 
Um, in particular, there's this thing called Puppets Against AIDS, which is a surprisingly believable explanation. Um, in the explanation, it's like Bunraku puppetry, and like yeah. there's a a, a van, oh, like that. and stuff All like right, that. I just looked it up to see what the puppets look like. Yeah. So, um, but like, I want to be completely like forthcoming with this. I don't think that that's necessarily what happened, right? Realistically, you know, there's it's, I the 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 looking at them the the puppets because they're more like large caricatures of people so they don't mm-hmm. the, the point isn't for them to look realistic it's for them to look exactly. like a caricature um because well, i don't expect a rogue puppeteer would have found their way into the field behind the school <laughs> well i think the the one of the like conceits of this is that like they saw a puppet show Ah, okay, and the, and the like, puppet show is influencing how they were recalling yeah. the the event. Or like, okay. yeah, like maybe. Well, I I think the implication was like a uh pu- like a wandering a, a traveling puppet show stopped by to give the kids a, a show, but none of the adults oh. saw it or something like that. Yeah. But regardless, it's not likely. But then again, neither is Alien. So yeah, one of well, them is physically possible. One two, of them one is more likely than the other, even if both are unlikely. <laughs> Even if both are unlikely, yes. Yeah. Um, realistically, though, Brandon, we will never, ever know for certain what happened, right? Because no one was there. There's no cameras. There's no additional like adult witnesses. There's no the 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 the, the interviews were were seated with certain intents and like meetings from various people, right? We'll never know. But let's be real. It's unlikely that it was a close encounter of the third kind. Yeah. Yeah. Um. But now let's just take a moment, uh, and I, I took this from um, Gideon Reed, and this is like a summary of everything, right? In terms of like what yeah. we know and all that stuff. So there were two hundred and thirty to two hundred and fifty children on the playground at the Ariel Primary School the morning of September sixteenth, nineteen ninety four. There were zero adults who saw or reported seeing anything unusual. Um, Randall Nickerson now says that three teachers saw something, but does not specify who, what they saw, where they were when they saw, or when they saw something. Um, there were 62 children who saw something they couldn't explain that day. A hu- roughly 188 children did not see or did not report anything unusual that day. 19 children saw figures. Uh, huh. two, roughly 231 students, children, did not see figures. Two children saw a three, uh, um, said they were th- within three to four feet or a meter away from a figure. 17 children uh, thought they saw figures, but from a distance. 77 days were between the, the sighting and Dr. Mack's first interview with the children. Dr. Mack interviewed 12 people. 50 people saw something and were not interviewed by Dr. Mack. The notable ex- exclusion is the one child who said she was a meter away from the figure. Ah, uh, okay. Um, seven children uh, were mentioned in Dr. Mack's write-ups of the interviews. Five were not mentioned in his write-ups. Huh. Three saw the figures and claimed they received a telepathic message from the aliens. Sixteen saw the figures and did not claim they received a telepathic message from the aliens. Zero is the number of pages of interview <laughs> transcripts that have been released since 1994. 104 is the number of pages of interview transcripts that exist. <laughs> and there are zero unedited, unedited interview videos that have been released since 1994. Now, this is all this is all aggregated by Gideon Reed, the person who's proposed the uh, um, the puppetry hypothesis, right? Yeah. But um, honestly, I, I I don't even think that like I don't think it matters what was there, what happened, realistically speaking, because at the end of the day, the burden of proof is on people who are claiming this is a UFO. Yeah, right? and I don't think that there's sufficient proof here to indicate that there's a UFO. And if anything, the evidence and data that they gathered was poisoned by their own gathering methodologies right yeah um and like so there is also this thing that all none of the kids have like gone back on their statement right i didn't Uh mention it here because 
it's commonly mentioned the the aerial school phenomena documentary uh covers the life of one of these kids uh grown up right and like looking at them and watching the the documentaries um <coughs> and i thought i wrote about this but apparently i must not have um these these like these people clearly were affected by what happened yeah um one of the families uh, moved away like one of the the missionary families moved away because like they didn't want their kid talking about aliens because inherently it like it it, it inherently like goes against the notion of christianity that like humans are like the big deal um yeah. because if there's other aliens then it kind of invalidates a lot of the bible um by nature right um but these these kids are like very like you know they, they seem as though it like it, it seems almost as though it was a traumatic experience for them yeah. right um and it might have been right i'm not i don't want to take away like what they experienced right mm-hmm. i just don't think what they experienced was a ufo what i think they experienced was something akin to the satanic panic where some adults came in and took something that was a misinterpretation and then like blew it way the fuck out of proportion and then resulted in them like basically getting silenced for repeating what was being said to them because their parents didn't have the same value set as the adults who encouraged this initial testimony. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And like, I think that's like tragic. Right. I I think, I think, Honestly, this is more complicated than just an alien story. I think that there's a lot of hay that could be made out of talking about, like, this as being a story of how, like, improper methodologies can have damaging effects on people, right? And it's part of the reason why uh, internal review boards exist, IRBs, right? It's to prevent people from fucking up kids. Yeah. Yeah. There's a reason that, like, there's a higher level of, like, there's a reason I don't interview people under 18. Yeah. And it's because shit like this can happen. It's very important, right? Like, yeah. you have to be extremely careful with children. Um, And I, I honestly think that more than anything else, this story is about how a bunch of adults fucked around with children and then the children found out. Yeah. And they're dealing with the, the consequences to this day, right? Um, and like, I'm also like, wait, like I said, I'm not doubting that people didn't see something right. Or that they don't believe, like, I also am not doubting that they believe it. Right. I don't think that this is a hoax. What I think it is, is a, a a fucked up situation where a bunch of adults took a narrative into their own hands and bent a bunch of kids to it. Right. Yeah. Think about, think about how like, children get indoctrinated all the time into beliefs of their parents or beliefs of the adults around them it's like a super thing it's a thing right um i think that's the more interesting story here than the actual like quote-unquote ufos because honestly the ufo story not that interesting i'm gonna be completely honest with you it's really really fucking uninteresting um what happens is a ufo lands a dude jumps out walks back goes away yeah right Made a wrong really turn. Not, yeah, it's like, uh, I must have made a wrong turn at Albuquerque. Yeah. Um, like, so I, I think that the the more compelling story behind this is the methodologies employed by the, the adults in these children's lives and, like, what possible impacts those things could have had on them. And it's interesting because, like, the, um, the teachers didn't, like, not believe the kids, right? Mm-hmm. Um, which is fine, but, like, I, I don't know. I think... I think there is a point where you can give a kid a little bit too much. Like, like don't, don't impose your belief system when you're trying to figure out what someone saw. Right. Yeah. Don't use your, your lens to, to recontextualize what someone saw. Let them, let them contextualize it to the best of their ability. Right. It's not your story to tell. It's their story to tell. Um, and in like, in the process of attempting to find out what happened, they told their own story and not the children, the story of the children. Um, but yeah, so that's the aerial school phenomena. It's not the <laughs> slam dunk for UFOs that people think it is. Um, but yeah, that's all I got for this episode, Brandon. Cool. It was a fun uh, one. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's fun. 
<laughs> it's super fun and not depressing at all. Um, anywho, I guess we'll do pluggables. Yep. So our website is criticpediacast.com. Our Instagram is at criticpediacast. So is our Twitter. Our email is criticpediacast.com or us at criticpediacast.com. Um, this Patreon listing is completely old. Uh, <laughs> we do have a Patreon. I forgot to update the Patreon listing, so I am rapidly approaching Patreon as we speak. Um, on that Patreon, you get uh, access to our show uh, scripts, um, which sometimes have fun pictures. This one, pretty devoid of pictures. It's, it's got it's uh, got a couple good pictures in it, but a lot of them a will have a lot of uh, picture. Well, you hear us describe the pictures half the time, so you'll get to see what we're actually trying to describe. Mm -hmm. It includes the full list of all the sources that we used for each episode. Um, sometimes there's fun sub-commentary. You like to put mm -hmm. little... Uh, little uh, uh notes under the pictures the, mm -hmm. Some, yeah. sometimes there's uh there's pictures of whale penises too there's pictures Don't of whale forget. penises sometimes That's I the add little uh pictures of quagmire's head around on occasion you do you do giggity occasionally giggity giggity um wow the patreon the patreon website has gotten worse <laughs> here we go for some reason, it put me into the patron mode, and I, it's confusing because Critopedia doesn't support any podcast. It doesn't support any Patreons. It's literally yeah. just a, like, our Patreon is literally just there, so when September rolls around, I can pull money out of it to pay yeah. for... For the hosting. <laughs> for hosting. Like, that's all I do. I pay yeah. hosting once a year with it, uh, or <laughs> occasionally buy a, a dumb thing. Um like a spirit box. Like a spirit box. Uh, but like... Anywho. Anywho. Um, all right. So I have the list now. This is up to date. Uh, our jackalopes include Will Smith, uh, Bushcraft Kelso, Lenwood S. Sharp, uh, Bird Schneider, Marty Von Party, and of course, Clay Sinclair. Hell Yeah. Um, we also, if you enjoy the podcast, be sure to rate, review, and subscribe. Um, if you can give us a, a especially on Spotify, for some reason we have a, <laughs> I don't know what is happening on Spotify, but we, I pissed some, one of us pissed someone off. Probably me. <laughs> it was probably me. I'll, I'll, I'll cop to that. I probably pissed someone off, uh, <laughs> because our Spotify, our Spotify rating is in the gutter. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So I don't know what the fuck happened there. Uh, but uh, if you have any monster requests or stories, be sure to send them in. Um, I've been trying to be better about that overall. At least I have. Um, and yeah, yeah. So that's the podcast. Oh, we also have a YouTube channel. Uh, yes. Which is, uh, I think it's YouTube at CryptopediaCast, if my memory is correct. It's in the show notes. Um, anywho. Yep, you could find me on Instagram at donkey underscore hands. My website is boyerb.com. My email is brandon at cryptopediacast.com. And my Twitter is at cryptobrandon. <laughs> and that's evidence that we're done. <laughs> yeah. um, on Instagram, I'm at mute2057. My Twitter is at JF Dunham. My website is johndunhamgames.com. And my email is john at cryptopediacast.com. Our art was done by Tom Hill. You could find him on Instagram at Thomas Michael Hill. His website is greatergloryco.com. And his email is tommikehill at gmail.com. As always, I'm John. I'm Brandon. And things are going to get weird. <laughs> My jerky gun showed up as we what? were recording. My jerky gun? What is a jerky gun? It's It looks like... So you, you ever put cock down? Like silicone caulking? Yes. It's that, but for ground meats. Oh. To make... I have I have a guy... Oh, I, to make like, like... Like to make jerky. It extrudes ground meats into jerky. And I have... And I have, and it has a Slim Jim attachment. It has a round attachment too, so it doesn't have to be flat because I've got some exotic meats in the freezer. <laughs>